Okay, here's my part two about physical courage. I don't know why that video shut off. I must have pushed the wrong part of the screen. I was telling the story about Larry Weiler, the kid in elementary school, and how he died a bad death. He would do uh, ice diving. He would uh, take, I guess, scuba stuff and get dive under the ice in quarries and stuff in the winter and couldn't find his hole to get back up and drowned under that. It was bad, well, I don't know, but sad. His sad life. I didn't know much about it, but he was a sad, troubled guy. Uh, so, I'm just changing there. Good, that's what I wanted. Uh, but, uh, oh, okay. So I kept talking. That's right. I kept talking, thinking I was recording. A uh, couple of stories I recorded were because uh, there were ev there was evidence of physical courage never a fighter but I would insert myself in situations I would do the right thing uh, Harvey Jackins was the inventor of co-counseling and uh, he was a brilliant guy I'm going to do a tape just about him he was a very brilliant guy uh, and we would go to workshops with him. He'd come to town and do workshops with the local co-counseling community. It was all community-based, all peer, self-help, but with teachers like him. And he was the creator and amazing guy, tough guy, labor organizer for the Communist Party, big strapping guy, and a man's man for sure. Uh, and they believed in validations, give you a sentence to say, and this stayed with me, my, my blog is healing validations. What's a sentence or an affirmation that helps you remember who you really are? And at a big workshop in front of a lot of people, he gave me one that went, if I die, I die, but I will never again not do the right thing. And boy, has that guided me. It did then, and even much more so in the four years since I woke up. Uh, yeah, if I die, I die. So the one story is my three or four year old son and I are at some kind of a fair and there's a big bruising guy menacing, harassing his tiny little estranged girlfriend or wife. And that two Two points, a couple hours separate at the fair, I inserted myself between them. Just got between them and basically said, you leave her alone. And he did, even though he was way bigger and younger than me. And I did it so effortlessly that my little son never got nervous, didn't feel scared, didn't respond at all. So I thought, okay, dad's having a conversation with this guy. <laughs> Another great memory. First date on the north side of Chicago. Uh, back before all the guns, it's, it would be a whole different situation now where everybody's packing in Chicago. But four or five or six black teenagers are beating up a fifth one, or the next, another one. And I just pulled over the car and said to my date, Sit, let's just stay here, I'm, I just need to do something about this. <laughs> I just went and broke it up, told them to go home, and they honored it. Uh, but the iconic turning point uh, after I woke up, this is me right before the COVID. As the COVID, I guess, was maybe already starting just a couple of months before I left my apartment in downtown Asheville, North Carolina, and left for the mountains. Uh, I had taken a big strapping black guy off of the street, this was something I would do, first with a good friend of mine who was homeless temporarily. But then this guy who was, I, I ran a couple of blocks to hear him playing his acoustic blues guitar. Asheville being, I think, the busker capital of the US, even much more than New Orleans. 
and people come from the mountains and he had just he had just come up from New Orleans. That was the story. That day was his day one or two in Nashville and he never never wanted to tell the story of what went on in New Orleans. Six foot four, very dark black man, he's homeless a lot of his life and a fighter. And he told me the story of how he had been a coward in his teenage years and his uncle had come back from service and taught him how to fight. So he was an infamous fighter. But I took him in and off the street to my apartment. Trusted him, liked him. There was a connection between us. We became infamous buddies. Oh my God, we were good buddies. And he brought out my badass side big time. And I was a safe person for him to show his tender, soft-hearted side, which he sure had. Guy would take, take homeless hookers in off the street to get them out of the cold only. No sex, unless they, unless they really, women couldn't keep their hands off him, so sometimes there would be sex. Uh, but uh, in my building, which was 98% white, uh, they loved him. He was sweet, very conversational and respectful and polite, uh, unassuming. Uh, the, old, the old people, and that building really loved him. But one guy, Alan Knott, clearly very racist guy who videotaped him using my key to get back in the building, which was not legal. Harassed him. He was a little punk. He was younger than me. He was like in the early 60s. A little punk. But <coughs> had it in for Eric. And finally, Eric was having a smoke out behind the building. And Alan comes by and says, and Eric was sitting on the curb, so he was small. Uh, what are you doing here, boy? You don't belong around here, boy. And before Eric had a chance to do to him what he was certainly about to do, Larry Williams, really strong black man, maybe the one black man who lived in that building, intervened, kept it from happening. Eric shows up in my apartment shaking like a leaf, enraged, humiliated. I say, well, okay, well, let's think, let's think, we'll do something. Uh, we'll uh, ruin his reputation in the building. I knew that was lame, and it, it happened automatically. Uh, okay, we'll go to the building and lodge a complaint. That was bullshit. That's not gonna, that's not gonna keep Eric from finding that guy and pummeling him. Uh, and then I had an idea, and I swear it came from God. I swear it was the voice for spirit. I say to Eric, I got it. I know what to do. And Eric brightly says, yeah, what are we going to do? And I said, not we. This one's mine. I got this. Well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to beat him up. <coughs> we both laughed. We both laughed. I'm a... Uh, Skinny, skinny but paunchy, 70-year-old psychologist, white middle-class guy, not a fighter. Eric says, <coughs> when was the last time you did that? And I said, well, not, and this is, I think, pretty much verbatim, the conversation. I said, well, uh, uh, I, I was checking the time because I want to keep it under 10 minutes for TikTok. Uh, I, I'm going under the auto piece. That's, there's an echo here. I said, no, I haven't done it in this lifetime, but I've got a good feeling about it, and I did, and we'll pick up from there. <laughs>